Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Raw Knuckles Podcast. Please like, follow, and subscribe. Goalies, uh, man, you rely on them. You need them. They have to be at the top of the game. They have to be consistent to be a starter in the NHL. But going to the Big Apple, and, and you know, you you named J.D., Ed Jockerman before you, the king, right? The king. He wouldn't be the king, by the way, if his name was like Tomas, okay? <laughs> his name is Henry. So let's let's cut it right there. He'd be the prince. With the king. John, yeah, Johnny, you're the king. When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down, and I never stayed down. And I was vicious, and I was malicious, and I don't care. <laughs> Very good to have you with us today. Say hi to Tim, my pal. Tim, glad to have you. Johnny and I, teammates. How are you? Um, good, good. Got the little mini sticks going in the background. Yeah, that's for me. For your development. That's perfectly for my size. Yeah. No, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. my my little. My you can little... make a few saves in that goal. <laughs> yeah. Make a few saves in that one. Yeah, my little guy kind of likes hockey, I guess. So I have no choice. But yeah, yeah, it's good. Good, good stuff. stuff. Good stuff. So, Johnny, I, I want to take you back to the beginning. Uh, growing up in, in Michigan, Detroit, right? Are we um, starting? <laughs> That's question one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and obviously, what was it that made that five, well, at the time you weren't 5'8", but that five foot eight uh, eventual goaltender in the National Hockey League. What made you want to get into the game of hockey? And then not only hockey, why the f you want to play goal? Oh boy, <clears throat> that's a big question uh, because <laughs> you know it. Growing up in Detroit, I mean, I wanted to follow my brother's footsteps, who was six years older than me, play goal. But you know, how do you really do that? I found out later in life that he started to play goal because he he liked masks. They were cool. Sports Illustrated did a lot of features on Jerry Cheevers. And, um, you know, he probably had the coolest mask of all times, right? The one with yeah. all the stitches in it. So, But they were plaster of Paris. And, you know, you looked at the evolution of the mask and from um, Plant to, you know, Dryden to Cheevers and all the greats, you know, Eddie Jockerman. It was probably the coolest thing that a, a sports person wore was a mask, you know. So that was one aspect. But more, more the availability to the position, right? I mean, um, you know, we, growing up in Detroit, I mean, we didn't have a lot of means. But down the street, somebody put a rink in their backyard and, Normally, nobody wants to play goal when you're freezing cold. So um, being probably one of the youngest kids in the neighborhood, hey, get in there. Get in there and let us shoot some pucks at you. So it's a natural progression. And, and um, you know, I loved all sports. I, I was decent at baseball and played short and caught and did all those things and just wanted to be involved with the play probably more than anything. If I look back on it now, um you know, the positions that, you know, gr that I gravitated to were the ones that you're involved in the game probably the most because I love sports. And it was a great way to uh, to grow up, I mean, inside sports. So, uh, of course, who doesn't want to be a hockey player or a football player or a baseball player when you're getting all kinds of cards and, you know, your collectibles and, you know, you're growing up inside a you know, an area that's kind of tough and, you know, this is a, this is a great avenue. So I think if I look back on it, I think that's probably the, the way that I gravitated towards the position. And you never had, um, you know, I guess there was never a point though, when you were like young playing goalie, where like all of a sudden you were getting scared of the shots because they're getting harder. That never, I, I tried to play goalie once in my, in my, my dad, no, it's a true story. And I yeah. was like nine years old, and I was—I remember I was outside in the backyard, and uh, late at night, my dad was like, "All right, he got me he like rented these pads." <clears throat> he took one shot; it was a slap shot, and hit me right in the neck. And that was the, the last time I put on That'd goalie be pads. Child abuse today? <laughs> yeah, no, he'd be in jail. I'd be visiting him in jail, but just yeah. like I mean, 
Yeah, I don't know how old exactly you were, but when that happened, I was like, there's no chance I'd be a goalie. But I don't know if that, you know, those type of things happened when you were young. Of course they did. I mean, I think we all had, you know, instances with a frozen ball. Remember the old orange ones that just <laughs> oh. used to kill? I mean, right in the thigh. But, I mean, it was uh, it was one of those things when you did it in the backyard or did it, you know, just uh, messing around was one thing. But when you got on the ice with a bunch of teammates, it was totally different. It's a different position than just playing for fun, playing mini sticks or anything like that. It's just a total different position. Um, it's a precision position. Most people, you know, as as Knuckles was uh, alluding to, you know, what would make you want to be a goalie? Like, you're half nuts. <laughs> yeah. And when you think about that, I mean, that's a little bit abusive, too, to, to say to a kid. But um, but it's, it's also one of those things that's the thrill ride, right? It, it's the thrill ride. When you get in the position, to some it, it scares them. To others, it's a thrill. And to me, it was always a thrill. It was a challenge. It was landing the plane on, on the paint in the you know with with the precision that that it called for. I mean, but you never know how good you're going to be. I mean, like, you never know if you're going to be consistent because the position is more of a consistent pos position than it is like really a creative one or. You just got to stop the puck, as as the old coaches say. But I mean, consistently or consistency is the name of the game. And, you know, I think when you separate the elements, you know, that's that's kind of me. I'm, I'm more of a consistent plodding along type of guy than I am this, you know, jumping up and down, you know, go be Chris Nyland for 30 seconds out there and, and um, come back to the bench, suck and wind and get to go back out there after the next three to five minutes. Uh, but... You know, for for me, it was a thrill ride. I think that I mean, I not that I'm a thrill seeker. I just think it was a thrilling position. Yeah, and I because I'm I'm five seven, so I I you know, and I'm you know I five eight on skates. You know, that's how I'd say it. But uh, just like you know, playing for me yeah. growing up, it was you know obviously when we started getting physical, like the the height thing was always an issue. I couldn't imagine from the goalie position though. I mean, was there ever times where like you were trying to be convinced of turning into like a, a player or forward like at any age by a coach or parents or anything uh with your with your yeah I, I don't think at that time it was an inhibitor okay um you know i think we as you move along in a career i mean of course if you're a taller goalie or positional player you're going to get more looks i think we've all faced that undersized players and today you look at it and nobody's going to be drafted under six two or there's going to be the rare commodity but um you know we we look at the position a lot different today so I, i'd say back then you know a lot of the great goalies and the consistent ones from gump worsley you know to as i mentioned jerry cheevers they weren't tall bernie perrant not tall and the tall guys Really, you know, Ken Dryden, probably the number one tall guy of all time, you know, they were a bit awkward and, and they weren't consistent because, you know, you could beat them through the five hole. They got caught, things of that nature. It was the compact, tight, smaller guy that became more efficient in the game and could stand up to the the rigors of a longer schedule. Like, that's another factor that nobody ever talks about is the schedule, how that impacts players and you know, the big guys today that can withstand that test of time, I mean, they're all going to have hip surgeries and things. I'm hearing things like, I'm fortunate that I haven't had to have any significant things after playing, but, I mean, uh, they're, they're, they're a train wreck. Yeah, those big frames, certainly. Uh, the in, in the style of goaltenders today, up and down and all that stuff, the stress on the knees, the joints, I get all that for sure. And, and Johnny, if, again, you, you have that career, you know, young minor hockey career, being an American kid, what was it that opened up the avenue for you to play junior hockey? You played up in the Sioux, and, and most American kids at the time, right, you play high school hockey, go off to college if you were any good or you had a shot at anything. 
you go the other way. I never, I never even as a kid growing up, I didn't know what junior hockey was. And I, I say this today, Johnny. I was a 17th round draft pick, 231 out of 235. If I played junior hockey, I'd have been a first round pick. I mean, Jimmy Mann was a first round pick. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and I could play the game. I so I I think if I knew about junior, I probably would have wanted to get out of town and go to play junior, but I didn't. What what drew you to going north? Yeah, I think that's a a really. <laughs> important question because we get it often as today but you know I, I i didn't want to go that route i wanted to go to the university of michigan growing up in detroit or michigan state uh two really good teams but they were run by canadians um and so not to get into the whole who ran ron what, mason was mason yeah um, in one of them michigan yeah ron mason was at michigan state and there were a couple others at U of M before Red Berenson. I was I predated him getting there. But the point is, is that, and I think the point you're making, Knuckles, is is that, you know, why choose that route? I mean, you're kind of having to break barriers to, you know, be accepted over in Canada, to play their game on their in their land. But it it just uh, it happened. I, I can't say that. Um, I orchestrated anything or it was anything I did. I got an invite, went up to try out. They drafted goalies up in the Sioux. They were a last place team. They just wanted to get better. Terry Crisp was the coach. And Woo. I mean, he didn't <laughs> want to have an American goalie. He just wanted to have a, the best goalie. And, um, you know, I beat guys out and uh, it was simple as that. When you, you know, when you can break some barriers, I mean, there wasn't a lot of Americans going to Canada to play. The guys that I knew of were allowed to cross back and forth. So that would be Ken Leiter, Mark Hamway from our area, guys that, you know, played a bit with the Islanders. And, but then the NCAA stopped that process. And I was probably in the first year of that where what confronted me was I would be violating my NCAA eligibility and that really wasn't a decision for me because it wasn't whether I was good in school or bad in school or any of the other factors. It was just wanting to play the game, the sport, and that's all I really cared about and got an opportunity and, and took took a hold of it. And I'm pretty sure if I failed, you know, early on, I would have been back home, you know, crying and laying yeah. bricks like my, my dad. So you go to junior um, and you go up there. How big of adjustment was that for you? Like we hear, you know, kids go off at a young age to play junior hockey. They go away from home the first time. Yeah, you're bored with the family usually and people watch over you, but you're not you're not at home. With your, you're out of your comfort zone, I, I guess. Yeah. And how big was that for you going there? And what, what type of adjustment was that? You know, initially, um, it was tough because you're being called a Yank and you're in a foreign land and people, you know, to give it perspective today is kind of hard to do because um, it's a global game and it's everybody's expected or accepted to play in anywhere you go. That wasn't the case. So, but I didn't hear all the nonsense. Uh, I was accepted by the team because I was actually playing well week to week. I was accepted by, you know, uh, the Billet family who was supportive, uh, but, you know, it was Canada, so it was a different place and, and whatnot, but I was meeting people. I was in high school. I was going to school some of the time. They didn't really make it a prerequisite, but, you know, they, it was a policy more than a, a commandment. And so, I just kind of liked the situation and reveled in it that you could play every weekend. You, you know, I ended up playing, I don't know, 45, six, maybe 50 games and had 40 wins. And, you know, so things yeah, are going pretty numbers, well. Yeah. So when things yeah. go well, you overcome a lot of the other obstacles, you know, I, I just, it's when you get down and you have a miserable time that all these, all the noise comes up and makes it more difficult. But for me, I wanted to get out of 
Detroit. I wanted to get out of home. I wanted to forge my own life like most do. I was probably a little bit young for that, but I was a little bit naive too and, and probably a little cocky to go with it. Just a little bit. <laughs> But I like that. And I think goaltenders and I, all of us athletes, I believe, you have to have a little bit of that cockiness. And sometimes it can be misconstrued and it, it's it's a little bit more maybe confidence than cockiness. Now, so you go play junior, you put good numbers there. When did you start to say, listen, I'm pretty good at this. I just might have a shot at playing the NHL one day. Uh I, you know, to answer that question accurately, I mean, this is where dreams get separated from reality is when mm -hmm. is, uh, I think when you're, I was drafted by the New York Rangers. And I think when the first time you step on ice at, at your first training camp and you really realize what's there and you can wait, you, you can gauge whether you're good enough or not. It, that was probably the first time when I got there, and I was like, "I'm better than that guy. I'm better yeah, than that guy." Yeah, you measure yourself, right? You measure yourself that against was probably the, the first yep. time. And you know, you measure yourself against the other guys that were drafted in the NHL, the Don Bow praise at that time, and others. You know, and and you're just looking to where you fit, and do you fit in the top group, the middle group? Or are you overwhelmed? I never felt overwhelmed, um, which is good. You know, but I, I did feel like, you know, I mean, that, that Rangers had a, 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 a rough bunch of characters. And in that time and day, you had to earn your spurs. And, you know, it was be quiet until you're called upon. And I, I was probably not quiet until I was called upon. Mm -hmm. But I, I also, you know, was respectful of the process. But I just thought that I fit. So I, I really believe from the time that I stepped on the ice as a drafted player that I was ready to play. I didn't have the same experience. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like I, I went over to Finland and then, you know, at my first training camp with Toronto, I got out there and I was just like, I was my size always kind of, you know, was an issue for a while. So, you know, that kind of played in my head too, like just kind of seeing guys and you know, um, just knowing that that was an issue to begin with, I would have kind of start believing it. But like you said, eventually <clears throat> I would just be like, I'm as, I'm as good as a lot of these guys, right? And I, it's interesting with the goalie position because, I mean, obviously I have no um, experience with it, but, I mean, you're really focused on beating out so many so many guys, right? I mean, there's probably, what, seven, six, seven goalies in camp, or how's that work? You know what I mean? Like, I, I could, I have to come, you know, as a yeah. forward, I'd come in and look at, I mean, I'd be looking at everybody, but um, I guess, I don't know if that was even a question, but I guess, I, you know, it's more of, you know, how did you feel with that, you know, being the position, I guess, right? Yeah, I don't think I looked at it at the time of uh, the numbers and where I fit on the depth chart, but I did you know, John Davidson was a goalie and led the team to the Stanley Cup Finals in 79. I got drafted in 81. Um, Steve Baker was, I mean, th these are two monster-sized goalies. Like, yeah, J.D. was boys. a big man, but he was on one leg and uh, was a great goalie, though, and he's a really good teammate and guy, like just a solid human. And uh, Steve Baker, who I came to know a little bit, was same. You know, he had a great attitude, but you know, it's six three <clears throat> and you know, came out of college hockey. The other <clears throat> excuse me, the other couple guys there in the system at the time were guys that most don't know. Rick Strack was one, um and he was playing uh college hockey, I'll call it, um, up you know, Potsdam area I think or something. But uh Steve Weeks, who was a NCAA champion, um up in Northern, and Ron Scott, who was in a standout with Michigan State, um, Canadian-born. So I I was probably after all of them. And, um, you know, so that's my was my position. And, you know, when injuries happen, when you're called upon in that position, it's different than any other position. So right now the hot topic is the Toronto Maple Leafs, right? 
and a young kid from Sweden plays his first game and gets a shutout in Toronto, and their goalies are struggling. So what are they paying attention to? I'm sure they're, mm-hmm. while they're paying attention to Austin Matthews and, and uh, their defense core and the trade deadlines upon them, they're looking at can this kid do what Ken Dryden did? Can he do what Patrick Waugh did? That's the way they look at the position because that's the, what the position demands. Can you take hold when you're given an opportunity? Do you have enough confidence in yourself to be ready and not think of anything else? Because nothing else really matters at the time. It's your opportunity, and you that's the position. You get the, you get the net, and you take it as long as you can. And if you think, and if anybody thinks today that that's changed, they're lying to themselves because it's still exi- it's a one position, right? That that hasn't changed. One position. Every other position may be changing, mm-hmm. and they need to use you know twelve forwards and sixty or seventy, and everybody needs to get a trophy, but not in that position because if you're good and consistent, <clears throat> you're going to play all night long. And I don't want to pick on Toronto. I use them as an example. Yeah, I mean, you can, <laughs> you pick, can on. pick. That's on. okay. No, we don't judge me on. being here in Montreal. Yeah. <laughs> but oh yeah, that's a good be... place to be right now, Montreal. <laughs> yeah, really. Oh. God, listen, uh, is there any jobs available with USA Hockey? You know, listen, I just got fired, John, um, from my radio job. So, yeah, I'd be more than happy to come back across the border. Um, so you go to Sioux, you put up the numbers, you, you end up going to camp, you come to New York, the Big Apple. Uh, Johnny's now in the Big Apple. And it's crazy, Tim and, and, and John. And John can speak to this better than me, but New York – is a goaltender's town Mm -hmm. like they've always had a thing for goaltenders now listen john just said it it's an important position it's the ones that never change goalies are man you rely on them you need them they have to be at the top of the game they have to be consistent to be a starter in the nhl but going to the big apple and you know you you named jd ed jockman before you the king right the king he wouldn't be the king by the way if his name was like Tomas, okay? <laughs> his name is Henry. So let's let's cut it right there. He'd be the prince. With the king. John, yeah, Johnny, you're the king. But, you know, coming to the Big Apple, how intimidating was that? All of a sudden, you, you leave the suit, you come to New York, the bright lights of Broadway, you know, the nightlife, everything for a young kid to get thrown in that. And I heard all the stories when Don Murdoch and all the boys down there like a lot of outside noise and and how'd you deal with that yeah coming in well i mean frank sinatra you know if you make it there you make it anywhere right and and um you know i never really knew new york prior to it i mean um obviously the ball drops there every january 1st and we all watch the parades and that's the way I knew New York. I didn't know it for really Times Square and how crazy it was other than it's a huge city. And I looked at it as what am I going to give to this hockey place? And, you know, when you start to get to know it in Madison Square Garden, the most famous arena in the world, you know, it doesn't hit you until you walk up the steps and people are like, hey, that's that young goalie they just called up. And, you, you know, they're like, wait, wait a second, they know me? I'm trying to sneak in here, but nobody sneaks into New York and nobody comes out alive really either. And, um, I will say this, that it's probably was the greatest honor of my career is to wear the uniform, especially my first time. And, um, and really having to prove that I belonged. And, um, it's a place that you really have to prove you belong more than any other place, I believe. I think that there's players out there that can hide in some obscure places, and nobody really cares if they have a good season or a bad season unless you bring up a contract talk. But, you know, for there, there you're, you're always in the top ten of ratings and the spotlight's there, and it's either you engage in the spotlight or you are going to, you know, waffle in it and uh, not engage. So, I mean, for me, it was pretty easy. I'm, I engaged um, fairly easily. But as far as the nightlife and things like that, we were, 
they created an environment that was a little bit more distant because of the things in 79, I believe. And, you know, being the uh, Studio 54 gang and, you know, you yeah. can talk to Dukes and some of the other guys about that. I'd never engaged in that, even though I would have liked to. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, my life was focused um, on trying to get well, the number one job. Was that because you were so focused, Bees? Because, yeah. listen, you know, goalies are different. I get yeah. it. But it, And I've been around goalies certainly my whole career, different ones. Yeah. And you were one of the only goalies I played with that really was like that. You were more with the boys than most of the goalies I played with. Yeah. They you know, a lot went off on their own, you know, or they kind of, but well, you I, weren't. Well, like I wanted that. to be a good teammate. Um, and I wanted to hang out with everybody. And I thrived on getting to know people and wanting them to get to know me. I had my missteps. Um, you know, I make no bones about it that, you know, sometimes you get over the top and things you say, things you do. But as far as going from, you know, day one to, you know, engaging with, with New York and being a part of it, it, you know, the environment that they created, you know, Knox, we were, at, we were, you know, we were out at Playland, out in Westchester County. We didn't engage a lot in New York City and all of that. So they... It was a little bit distant, so we were more of a family type team, and I really loved my family. I still do, obviously, but you know, we were a family group. We wanted to get to know each other. We did a lot to, together, and at that time, this, you know, the the way that team was going, it needed to do the extra in order to create an environment because it was a fractured environment, um, in my view. And then, you know, we got players that wanted to stick up for each other. And we became a team again, so. I mean, that's what every team goes through. They go through these processes mm -hmm. right now where teams, are, you know, go up, come down. But the one thing that doesn't change is becoming and getting buy-in and everybody sacrificing for each other. You know, that is a remedy that right now that people can't bottle and they want to know, you know, what it takes. And GMs get fired, coaches get fired over not being able to – it's not because they're not smart. It's just you can't get everybody on the same page. So I wanted to be on the same page as everybody else. I wanted to be one of the guys. Um, so it, was, it wasn't that difficult for me. Do you remember uh, <clears throat> your first NHL game? What was that like? I was 18, and I got called up because J.D. and, and um, Steve Baker both got injured, and so they're into their depth. Uh, so they, I guess I was the only available guy. <laughs> so, um, But I got called up, and... You know, it was in Colorado, um, you know, played against the Rockies. Now they're a baseball team. So uh, we knocked them right out of the league. Uh, but <laughs> we won 2-1, and Nick Fatio was on the left side, and this guy, Paul Gagne, scored on me, you know, early in the game. We got down one nothing, and uh, he kept on coming back to me. That was my guy. I'm so sorry. And I'm like, get back. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. Just get away from me. And um, – we ended up scoring a couple goals and winning. And Colorado wasn't a great team, but you know Chico Resch was at the other end, and you know I, uh, I I modeled myself a little after Chico, and he, you know, for an undersized goalie, you look at other undersized goalies, and I I always had a lot of respect and watched Chico play and his Islander days and Stanley Cups and things like that. So it was a great thrill, and they had some good players. Rob Ramage was on the team. I think he was their first overall pick, and. You know, they had some decent players, but, I mean, everybody was just worried about me getting a start as an 18-year-old kid. And then, you know, we had a long plane ride home because we played Calgary, believe it, at the next night. So they flew Steve Weeks home, who who has been – was I think he started 16 straight games. And then they gave me a shot. So that was my first game. 16 st straight. Imagine that today. That, that, yeah. that would be child abuse. They, they, these kids today, <laughs> it's abuse. like, oh, my God. Yeah. Back-to-back. Back. <laughs> well, that's yeah, the question, back right? Back. I mean, like <laughs> – the uh, the schedule, uh, you know, I mean, it was a 21 team league then, right? So, yeah, um, going out west was a big thing, you know. People circling their calendars for, you know, when do we play in L.A. and you don't want to know when you're playing in Edmonton and Calgary because that was a tough yeah. trip. So Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, I got the last game. Uh, I think we went L.A., Vancouver, Calgary at that time or something like that, and you know, it was it was good. Um, the next night we, as I said, um, 
you know, I think I, I, I can't recall all of it, but playing your first game was certainly a thrill. This episode's brought to you by BetterHelp. We all know how easy it is to get swept up in the fast pace of life. So much so that we forget about ourselves. It happened to me. And most of you know I've battled addiction and have been clean and sober for years. I thought I could confront these issues on my own. I couldn't. I've become a big believer in the positive impact of therapy. It helped me to learn positive coping skills and how to set healthy boundaries. It actually empowered me to be the best version of myself. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, I suggest BetterHelp. It's entirely online. It's convenient, flexible, and you can arrange everything to fit your own schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And quite frankly, I wish BetterHelp was around when I was looking for help. It's so easy and flexible. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Raw Knuckles today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. Dot com slash Ron Knuckles. Yeah, you play that first game, then you end up going back down. Yeah. Didn't you go back down yeah. after you played that first one? Yep. Yeah. Immediately. Now, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, immediately. <laughs> uh, so, boom, see you later. Don't let the door hit you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then coming back up, like, uh, how long did that take you to get back to the show? And the next time did you stay? Uh, I didn't stay right away. Um, I, it was two years. So I went back, played two more years of junior, uh, didn't think that that was going to happen, but it allowed me to play in the world junior tournament twice, which is a great experience. And then, um, went uh, in my first training camp, I would call that as a legit pro, right. Age wise, you know, um, I got sent down, uh, with a host of other 80 Olympians, which was a bit shocking. George McPhee was on that team, who's now the GM, yeah. well, president in Vegas. And so, um, you know, it was a little bit of a, a shock, but um, I didn't take it bad. Like, it was just, let's go play hockey. And um, this is what you're dealt. And we were going to Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was not a <laughs> hockey town, but not listen, fun. it's not something you can. You know, you know, Knox. At that time, it's not like we could put up a stink. And yeah. Tim, I don't know if you've battled it before, but I mean, you you just did what you're told. You you just you didn't call your agent, say no. they sent me down. And I remember, um, you know, there's some other guys did that, but I that wasn't me. I just went down. It was Ron Scott, and myself. We played with Tom Webster in Tulsa. I mean, that team that the. the the team carried on even after we folded halfway through the year, but we won the championship and we played all our games out of Colorado at the end of the year. And, you know, we won and Craig Patrick was the GM at the time with, with New York and I'd gotten called up for the playoffs. Uh, so, you know, the Rangers at that time were in a battle with the Islanders and we almost beat them and we lost uh, when we lost Barry Beck. You know, things kind of the hit by Pat Flatley on Barry Beck was kind yeah. of a big point in Ranger history because we were trying to overcome the curse. <laughs> so, um, but the Islanders were a tough foe and they were a legendary team. Um, it's kind of one note on that is it's kind of sad to see guys like Clark Gillies in that pass at a young age, you yeah. know. So I just had so much respect for those guys. Even when you lost to him, you knew. You know, you did your best, but um, yeah. So I was called up for the playoffs at that time. Glenn Hanlon played, and you know, I was in that kind of. Are they going to play the young guy? But uh, Herb Brooks at the time chose to go with Glenn Hanlon. He played fantastic, so it wasn't a bad decision. But I got put in for the old goalie poll, you know, where your skates are dull. You got a the five minutes to go, and here comes Trotche and Bossy you know, on a two on one. Yeah. Fortunately, Bossy fanned on the shot or whatever i was like couldn't wait for the whistle to come fast enough to skate off the ice and but i mean it's these small experiences that when i got sent down it it was truly humbling but it helped me for sure and wayne thomas who was a goalie coach at the time said yeah. you know um you're not going to look at it now but 
this year in the minors is probably going to be the best year of your career to, to give you perspective. And you know what? He was right. I called my agent a lot, but it was at the end of my career when I got old and shitty. So <laughs> <laughs> That hits everybody. Yeah. <laughs> You're not yeah. unique to we that. All, we all hit that. There's no question. John, um, so your time in New York and, you know, I was playing in Montreal at the time and, you know, I end up getting traded and I chose New York. I actually got traded by Serge to St. Louis. And I always saw Phil Esposito and, and Joey Bacchino and I'd see them after we played down in New York against you guys. And Joey said, oh, I'd love to have you here, Knuckles, and da, da, da. Yeah. So, you know, it was yeah, actually it was a, a bit of tampering, uh, I would say, <laughs> in today's game or even then. But doesn't exist. Sir traded him in St. Louis. I told him, listen, I don't want to go to St. Louis. I want to stay close to home. Uh, I'd love to go to Boston. Can't do that. Um, and I said, how about New York? And he called Phil. Boom, it was done. I come down to New York, and, man, um, it was so different for me. Uh, I, I, I mean, I was shocked. I got traded to begin with, but I had a beef with the coach. But I come in. And and you guys were going for a playoff spot that year, right? You were battling. You lost a bunch of games. I come in and, uh, you know, we lost. The first time we didn't make the playoffs, we lost on the last, last day of the uh, season. Yeah, Remember that? Yeah. Unbelievable. Tim, we we had to win our last game of the season, and then what was it? The Devils had to – the Devils, if they tied or lost, we're in the playoffs. Yeah. And John McClain. Overtime. Right? He, yeah, he tied it with less than five minutes oh. left and then won- yeah. scored the overtime win of it. And we were watching it. I'll never forget it in the locker room. Yeah, but we beat Quebec, I, I think, 2 nothing, And we thought we were yeah. in. And Johnny with the, the goose egg <laughs> yeah. for us. Well, the thing is, the team was playing so well. Like, we really had a shot to be a tough out. We were, you know, as we got knocks, we got tougher. We were, we were a real team, though. Uh, we really came together. I think we won... 19 of our last 22 games or something like that so we were yeah, on a good we're on run fire. nobody wanted to play us we knew that but the devils hadn't ever made the playoffs <laughs> in their history yeah so all in that moment of emotion you know because if they tie we're in there's like yeah. what 30 <laughs> seconds ago he did a turnaround slapper and it was just a hope shot oh. and they made it and it was uh you know that turned out. I'll to, never forget. I know, but that turned out right. to be the legendary Schoenfeld uh, co-ho story. Oh, <laughs> have yeah. another donut. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> have another donut. <laughs> so that, something yeah. good came out of that. <laughs> yeah, for so, sure. Go ahead, Lex. But um, no, no. I yeah, would go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Timmy. I was just yeah. I was just gonna say uh, uh, you know now that when you started getting in the NHL, like was there any. I guess uh, guys, you know, shooters, guys that shot the puck that you were just like, you know, shit, like I got to deal with this guy. Like he's just a guy you feared. Um, you know, I, obviously I, I could maybe imagine maybe like an Al McCannis or something, but was there anyone you had that you consistently kind of was like feared taking the shot against? Well, I mean, it's, it's the teams you play the most. Um, you know, I mean, I played my pretty well my whole junior career against Al. Knew he had a great shot. Never really intimidated by him. Uh, when you I mean, we played him a lot, so when you play him a lot, you're either you start to know the tendencies and you're comfortable. Like on a power play, if he starts to inch in, you might not have a chance, right? However, it's the guys that are legendary that you don't know that much about that you get intimidated by, such as a bossy. I mean, there's probably not a better scorer in the history of the game for the amount of time that he played than Mike Bossy. He's incredible. I mean, just his shot was, you know, the best shot you've ever faced because he never missed. He never missed his mark, and, and it's just never missed the net. You never hear the glass behind you. You know, the one time he muffined the one that I said <laughs> was like probably the only time in the history he didn't, he didn't score. Uh, when he had an opportunity. But, um, you know, you go from that list to the guys, you know, we'll we'll start talking about some legendary players like Lemieux, right? I mean, it wasn't just a shot. It was everything. Like, he just, he was an everything 
scorer. Like he was built to score goals in the National Hockey League, and he makes you look silly. So I remember one of the first games we played in Pittsburgh, we we won seven three, and he had all three goals. It was like early in the um, in the year. It was our first team to chime to Pittsburgh, and I was I just sat on my seat, kind of in the back of the bus, and. I know Grant Ledyard was sitting next to me and he turned to me and goes, what are you, like, we just won 7-3. What are you worried about? I'm like, did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> what are you worried about? The guy mm -hmm. had all three goals. He's a phenomenal player and we got to face him six more times. So it was more of that than saying, you know, Brett Hall was a great shooter or it was the wild guys that you didn't know. And some guys got your number, you know, like Johnny LeClaire. <sighs> just pitchfork yeah. pucks that just would sink on you. Like he didn't know where it was going, which <laughs> makes, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, you know, it's that kind of unpredictability that, you know, it was tougher in practice probably than it was ever in a game because of guys hitting rolling pucks. And we played on a lot of bad ice and practicing in stupid times and stupid places and coaches just, would not let their foot off the pedal. They literally didn't know how to coach. And because they didn't really care about the players, they just cared about their plan and what they wanted to carry out. And I don't say that with disrespect. I just, you know, video wasn't in and they didn't pre-scout games and they didn't give us information like today. Uh, I mean, it's overload. It's overload, but by the same token, you need the information. Like, I mean... You'd have to guess who the, like, I remember Mark Messier when I had a couple of years playing with him, you know, talking to guys about a college guy that's a centerman. Like, he wanted to know all about, like, how does this guy take a draw? And how is he, people thought that Mark just showed up, put on his stuff and played. He wanted to know everything, all the tendencies. You know, if I give him a shot, will he give me a shot back? I mean, the tendencies in the game. So it's a long-winded answer to the question. Like, I really wasn't intimidated by anybody, but. They had, there's guys that had our number as a team and it's just the way it flows, right? I mean, whether it's, you're playing Washington and Mike Gartner, you know, or, or, you know, the guy, the teams in the East, the old Patrick division was a tough division. You know, we, we played the Islanders more than anybody, you know? And when you're winning yeah. four or five Stanley cups, you're playing the, you're playing the best team seven times, you know, and then. You know, St. Louis is playing Toronto, in right? And Toronto couldn't get out of their way at the time, you know? So, you know, I think matchups, when you play the Montreals um, a lot, you you know, like, you're not going to get away with stuff that you will play in, you know, in an obscure place. It's just, it's pure hockey. And that today has kind of changed. That's the one thing that's changed. The uniqueness of the game, going into a special building, a Boston Garden, you know, four or five times a year. And, you know, those are special places and unique where you needed to know the boards. You needed to know how fast the runners were. You needed to know the glass. Today, it's just all cookie cutter, just show up and do the same things over and over again. And there's, you know, 40 bad games. If you're like me and you're going to play some golf this summer, you have to check out this hidden gem. Windmill Heights sits atop the beautiful hills in Notre Dame de Ile Perot. They have affordable rates and they offer customized membership opportunities for all levels. If you want to book a tee time, call 514-453-7177. Hit them straight. If you love your pet like I love my St. Bernard Adele, you'll want to feed them a balanced, biologically appropriate raw diet. The reason I've chosen Formula Raw is because all blends of their food are locally sourced and they consist of exclusively human-grade meat and organs, as well as fruits and vegetables. And all products used are hormone and antibiotic-free. So like I said, if you love your pet like I love Adele, you'll choose Formula Raw. Make sure you go to FormulaRaw.com and use the promo code RAWNUX at checkout to receive 10% off your first order. That's Raw Nux. R A W K N U X. So you look again, I, I want to get maybe a little bit more that when we look at our time together and playing in that division, it was a little different for me. But 
as teammates and, and friends. Um, we do share a pretty good little story together, John and I. And we had some fun together, <laughs> no question about it. But um, Knuckles, uh, I, I was bitten by the injury bug, Tim, back down there. I broke my arm a couple times. Remember, Johnny? Oh, I was friggin' miserable. And I hurt my knee. I had the hockey hernia. I, I was, it, honestly, I, I, when I went to New York, I might as well have went to Afghanistan. It, it, I was just hurt all the time. And um, we ended up, um, I came back, and we played a game in Buffalo. And the boys went out afterwards, and Knuckles was pretty hungover on the flight home. And Johnny's sitting right behind me, and I took my shoes off because my feet were swollen. I took my shoes off and laid back, and all of a sudden I wake up, the plane's landing, and I look down, my shoes are gone, Tim. Where are my shoes? I turn back, I look at Biza, he, I don't know, Greshna, I don't know. So, okay, <laughs> so I figure the plane lands, I'm going to get my shoes back from the flight attendant. Well, I never get my shoes. So I walk through the airport, barefoot, suit on, the boys hung over, feeling like crap. Get on the bus, get off the bus, pouring rain out, and I walk in my suit to the car, barefoot, right through the parking lot. <laughs> I'm just steam coming out of my ears. My favorite shoes. And so I do a little investigating, and I find out that the guy behind me grabbed my shoes, <laughs> passed them to a rookie, and the rookie put them up in the overhead thing and never gave them the stewardess. So I find out the two culprits. So after practice one day, I went for a few beers with a teammate, and uh, we stopped at the fish market, and it's spring, just springtime, to get some fish for dinner. I grabbed some of the scraps from, you know, they cut the skin off, all that. I grabbed a bag of scraps. And the boys were all on the ice the next day, and I was getting therapy, and I ended up, uh, I, I ended up going out to the parking lot, and I took the back seat of Johnny's Volvo, I took it out, I stuck the bag of fish under the seat and I screwed it back in. Boom, John, maybe things are starting to get warm. He's driving one day with Mark Hardy, teammate, and he goes, hey, Hoppo, he said, I think my wife was driving a car and do you smell, do you smell something funny in here? He said, I think she hit a skunk or something. And Hoppo said, I had all I could do to keep from laughing my ass off. He said, no, I don't smell anything. <laughs> oh. Anyway, Johnny, I, t take it from there, Johnny. There's nothing to take what, from there. It's a it was story, but yeah. you got to get the right. No, he still did, hasn't got the right how guy. How do you get though. to the bottom He of it. still hasn't how got the right How do you get to the bottom he says, of it? He says, he tells the story, and this is his version of the story. So we'll let you have your, your moment because you already had your moment. It's a true story when it comes to the car and the fish. But it's not a true story when it comes to the shoes. And he thinks he's got <laughs> yeah, the right see. guy, but listen, that'll I, live in uh, infamy as my... getting the right, because the guy that tells him <laughs> the story. <laughs> yeah, I pride myself on being honest and open. So, How's that going? Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, That's going very okay. good. And so here's the deal. Johnny can't get to the bottom of it. He's looking everywhere. He looks under the seat, his seat. He looks in the engine, looks everywhere. He finally brings it to Volvo. They t tear the car apart, and they finally <laughs> take the seat out, and they find a bag of fish. And he comes in, and I'm like, hey, way to go. Uh, how about the other guy he passed him to, Darren Turcott? So Turk, he got scared. I found out he was the other guy. I go to his house one night with Mark Hardy, because I didn't know where it was, and we both had a couple cocktails. I stopped at home, I grabbed a big butcher knife, and Hoppo drives me over to Greenwich, Connecticut, and we pull up, and there's a house up on Little Hill on a knoll, and you see the uh, through the front window, the TV's flashing, you know? So the boys are in there, three of them live together, rookie, and the car's right out front of the house. So Hoppo pulls up, I jump out, I go up, I get two tires 
And I come running back and hop over and Mark Hardy, he is in the front seat laughing his ass off. He cannot stop, right? And I get in the car and he looks at me and he goes, you're only going to get two? And I said, yeah, right. And I went back. I got the other two. Next day, Turcotte comes in. He goes, man, tell everybody. But yeah, someone slashed my tires last night in Greenwich. I said, hey, you know, you haven't been playing too well. The fans in New York are crazy, you know. He didn't have a clue. Uh, so anyway, the boys, uh, they wish they never took my shoes. Doesn't sound like you're from Long Boston either. Short. They're slashing tires. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. Just a little bit. But, no, we had fun. We, had, Johnny, we had a a great bunch yeah. of guys, you know, the sweet. How about Tomas yeah. Sandstrom, Yanni Erickson, the, the Swedes, yeah. uh, Ulfie Dahlin, like just a really good yeah, group we, of guys. We had right? a tight team. We had good young players and a team that was coming together. And, and um, you know, it was – it's funny because um, having been there before obtaining some of the players that we did and then afterwards what the team became, you know, you go through – changes and regime changes and that was probably the funnest group we had during my time there I've, i was asked by ron duguay uh recently on a rangers podcast about uh about <laughs> up in yeah, the blue well, seats, about time right? my time yep. there which was it, it kind of he preceded me and he was into the whole studio 54 act which was different but our group was more of a family type of group and um you know, I was proud of that group, to what we became, because, you know, we made a couple runs. We scared some teams. We just never had, you know, enough firepower, I'd say. Or some people would say we never got the right save at the right time. But eventually that would change. And um, But, you know, at that time in New York, we didn't have um, all the money either that they probably have today. Um, you know, we... we they ran a pretty tight team. We didn't charter planes. We didn't, you know, do the things. Yeah, fly commercial. Yeah, we didn't stay in the Ugh. top places. We didn't, you know, we didn't have a lot, I, but we had enough. And it was more important to have good teammates. And I wouldn't sacrifice that for anything today, is to be on a team of good people and love to be together, play cards together, have fun together. You know, that's value. Um that's irreplaceable value. And I think that if, if you could figure out the recipe of how to share that with some teams today, they would probably really like to have it. And, um, you know, so, I mean, we, success, right? I mean, only one team raises the Stanley Cup. I mean, I know Nux, you did, I didn't. Um, but I don't look at it as my time as being unsuccessful. Yeah, again, I raised it. It was just at like my buddy's so Stanley Cup party, <laughs> but if that counts, <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it does count. No, <laughs> the and it's true, John. A lot of guys who look at great play, like Marcel, one of our teammates, yeah. never the, the career he yeah. had. He had an unbelievably successful career and didn't get that opportunity. I feel blessed yeah. that I had that Mike Gartner opportunity. Be yeah, the, yeah. The, I mean the right. I know Mike Gardner with the Rangers, and he ends traded, up getting yeah, traded, trade right? Yeah, like, that would be before the like miracle today. happened. Yeah, yeah like um, when you look at your career, and I, I, I guess I want to. What's the? Because you said it, you didn't have a lot of injuries afterwards. I've dealt with numerous surgeries and arthritis and different stuff, but you know, certainly that small compact frame that you have. And very focused, fine-tuned athlete you were. Um, you know, uh, there were always some of those, you know, kind of fat, dumpy goalies. You were never that. You were in very good shape. But uh, injuries, like what was the toughest, like, injury you ever had playing? Like, like a toughest shot. Did you ever take one in the nut bag where you, <laughs> your, your left nut, like, grew like a watermelon or something? Well, we tried to stay away from that, but it, it occurred from time to time. But I never really had a had an instance with that kind of injury, which I was fortunate. Um, and I don't, I'll leave it there, but the, okay. <laughs> the ones in, you know, in the game, like, I mean, I, I off the ice before my first son was born, I cut my wrist and, and such in 88. And, um, that led to some, you know, so an injury to my hand that, 
changed some movement in it and um yeah. you know i had some tendons cut and things like that but remember that yeah but the you know i came back back from that fairly successfully and um so that was good but on the ice you know i mean i i mean i've been i was rocked a lot of times uh when you come out to play the puck you know dale hunter wasn't stopping and today it's it's powder puff you know like um it'd be a five game suspension if you finished a goalie outside the crease and and but Dale used to go looking for that and that's the type of player he was and if you didn't know that you know but you risked it so one I mean in the second period I remember he just smoked me and we were up two to one and it was three to two before I even knew it because I was in la la land but you never pulled yourself out of the game or anything like that but I you know I mean I, I sustained a back injury um uh one season where I'd played I don't know, like 16 or 17 games in a row. And I had brought my son to the rink and I was just skating. And then it seized up out there. And I, you know, it allowed Mike Richter to get a bit more play. And um, we went in the playoffs and he had gone on a good run because of it, you know, and uh, ended up playing in the playoffs, which is, you know, the coach's choice. But we had good goaltending, you know, him and myself was a good tandem. And um, we could win with both guys, but... You know, as far as injuries go, uh, I was very fortunate that I'd never really sustained a long-term injury on the ice. Um, you know, I tried to keep myself in, in good shape. But, I mean, you could when you were playing consistent amount of games. The hardest part, you know, when I went over the Devils at the deadline and doing off all the off-ice stuff, and then I played a, a game, and then Marty would play 20, and then I'd play another game. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, or yeah, fortunately that, that one didn't last too long for me because it was at the end but i mean it's hard to stay mentally and physically focused if you're not playing a lot uh but i was fortunate that i never sustained a really yeah. who was who was the biggest pain in the ass to you like come yeah. on yeah well like you got like that me, remember that tim you that played sean avery yeah, yeah that's sean avery martin the moment space. like did you have yeah. anyone that just yeah. yeah you hated yeah we had many guys but i mean again it's the guys you play against the most the dino cicerelli's dino was probably one of the harder guys um in front of the net he was known for being in front of the net a lot and you know he <clears throat> not only could he shoot the puck real well he was an agitator but he tried to be your friend you know he'd be like yeah just trying to stand here yeah. you know don't th- and I'd be trying to hack him in the ankles, and he'd be like, ah, oh, come on, we're buddies, friends. You know, I got a bonus coming up here. I, I just need a, you know, like, I mean. And then the guys that were accidental tourists that used to come in and just crash the net. You know, one of the guys that was famous for it, who's an all-time great, is Tiger Williams. And he was, yeah. one, we were playing, he was in L.A. at the time. And I don't know how many teams he played for, but he came crashing into the net. And his smell was so <laughs> bad. Like, it's garlic mixed with tiger balm. Oh, everything. And he crashed <laughs> in the net, and his, you know, he's got no teeth in his head. And, you know, he clipped my shoulder, and my shoulder, I mean, it was, like, a little sore. And he, I looked over there, and he's like, hey, I'm coming again. <laughs> And I'm coming again. And I'm coming again. And he got closer to me, and I go, you stink. Get uh, up. He goes, ah, and he's just breathing all over me like that. It was just, uh, those are the instances with, like, he was an all-time great personality, and it's the all-time great personalities that try to get away with stuff, like Tiger Williams. That's what the game's made of, you know. But we had, I had more guys bother me that were on my team <laughs> than probably that, that were would not put, on That would team. put, like, fish <laughs> in, in your practice car? and stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Knuckles was good. He kept it. He kept it down. He shot it. The <clears throat> shot it on the ice. <laughs> yeah, I have respect for the starting goaltender. He had no respect for the backup guy. <laughs> took all the abuse, um, Johnny. Yeah, that's funny. Um, so that uh, when I think, um, God, the times in New York. So, I mean, you know, we had on the other day, uh, Tim and I, and Tim's a friend. DB Swinney yeah. joined yeah. us the other day, and. We, what a, a great talk we had. I, and, and we caught up on those old days in New York. He had, he was really, uh, we had a lot of fun talking with him. You, you yeah, 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 no, right? he, yeah, and all that. well, I mean, I think everybody remembers DB <laughs> and being an actor and a lot of 
decent roles, but a big hockey fan that used to, you know, hang out with mm. us quite a bit. And um, mm. I believe last time I talked to DB, he was living in Chicago and he had a kid playing and he likes talking yeah. hockey yeah. a lot. You know, every now and then he, <laughs> he pops on my scene and starts getting into all these stories. And I'm like, DB, I don't have time to go through all <laughs> yeah. of them. But <laughs> he loves the old hockey yeah. stuff. Um, uh, Rosalind, uh, your wife, uh, certainly just a wonderful mm-hmm. woman and the kids, uh, awesome stuff. Everybody good, Johnny? Yeah, no, everybody's good. Today? Thanks for asking. Um, you know, we're married 36 years and, um, proud of that. And, uh, yeah, our four boys, yeah. we have five grandkids, uh, another one on the way in May. Uh, so everybody's good and a couple are local. And, um, you know, so we're very proud of our family and everybody's good. So the, the kids ever get to that age, cause you went from New York to the Panthers and yeah, you know, I, forgive me. I forgot that you were the most penalized that we do have something in common. You were the most penalized goaltender in the history of the New York Rangers, by the way, pal, <laughs> I did my research, you little goon goalie and, uh, it, it, did the kids get have an opportunity to see you play, and um, or did they ever get the opportunity to see you fight guys like Barrasso and <laughs> Kelly Rudy? Uh, uh-uh. Huh? You had the goon game going. All the things you're proud of, and then there's things go? you're not how proud of. How are the goalie fights? I think, let me ask yeah. you. Well, how about the Rudy? He came after you, Rudy, right? After you threw a shot at Sutter, which I get. Like, he, you should have punched that Sutter yeah. in the mouth. There's no, no question he, about it. But, Kelly, Kelly's heroes. He was always a hero. He wanted to come down the other end and have a little time. Yeah. That's fine. But uh, my my oldest, Ian, um, he he has become a yeah. huge Panther fan. He watches the games with his son. Um, so I, I'm kind of I didn't know that. You know, you don't know what your kids are going to gravitate to. I think that's the bulk of your question there. Um, and yeah. you know, do they? talk about the fights and because you can pull them up and show the grandkids <laughs> like hey look at you and Hextall going yeah. at it or, or but fortunately there wasn't a lot of those um and uh but i do remember um playing in a game in philly where there was a little bit of a uh, dust up and i was playing in philly at the time and this kid i don't even remember his name now he's a french goalie a lefty and I had to skate down the ice like midway because he was being a jerk. And so I grabbed him, pushed him against the wall, and he just let me do whatever I wanted to do. So I pushed him against the wall, and he, I looked at him, and I could see my kid's face. You know, like, you're beating up your son here. You know, like, and I was like, I think my time's coming to an end on the ice here pretty soon because this kid was like a rag doll. I, I just got him like this, and he was like, you know, yeah. jellyfish and all over the place. I'm like, why are you letting me do whatever I want to do? <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, it's th- those types of things don't happen much anymore. I mean, um, and I, I, I think that's a good thing. But, you know, the goalie, the, the atmosphere, you know, that kind of stuff sticking up for each other. I mean, that was just part ingrained. You just had to you didn't have to really fight. You just had to stick up for each other. Let the fighters fight you know the scorer score the goalie stop the pucks i mean like but people are are out of their lane now a little bit you know where you don't have to stick up for each other and they wonder why they don't have a team and um you know those things are changed and that's part of the game you know evolving uh in a way um you know I, i think we'd all agree some of the you know everybody that's getting close to 60 that's probably still around the game a lot that sees some of the downfalls of it is you know re-refereeing game i'm on too many calls weekly on poor officiating that has to re-referee a game because they got video and they they're not getting any smarter and it's not to pick up on pick on officials it's just the game happens so fast sometimes you just have to let things go and let them be you know but we we got to get every call right well you don't even when you re-referee it, you don't get it right. So I'm watching a game the other night, and I'm watching because of the World Championships, and we're looking. So I'm not watching all the great games, 
I got to watch some of the teams that are not in the playoffs. And and Arizona, I believe, was in Toronto and it went to overtime. And Toronto made a great comeback. They tied the game four four, and Matthews gets interfered with in overtime. Clear interference, and you know they end up <laughs> they end up losing in overtime. And you know Matthews can't do anything about it. And and that, the commentators say. Um, you know, the, the refs have been told to put the whistles away in overtime now. Let the players decide. Well, what kind of sense does that make, right? I mean, it, in years gone by, that would have started an absolute Donnybrook. But the, yeah. what happens the next game? The next game, Matthews is getting interfered with, with Dahlin, and he cross-checks the guy in the neck and gets a two two-game suspension. Uh, do you know? Do you follow and understand what leads to what? And that that's not making anything any better by saying you're going to re-referee the game or suspending anybody. And you know, oh, hurt me. He he loses a hundred thousand bucks. I mean, I don't I don't get that process. And wh- how did I get there? You know, in this part of the conversation is like when you're in it as deeply as I am on a daily basis with those types of things. I'd like to usher back in some of the, you know, late eighties, early nineties, because the rule book was written mostly then. And it's gotten rid of a lot of the, you know, slashes on the hand. So Mario could go through the middle, but it hasn't entered back into until you get to the playoffs, right? Some of the real good yeah. team building things in the game. And I'm not just talking about the fighting, because you started with the goaltenders. I'm just talking about <clears throat> sticking up for each other. I was going to say, no, and I wasn't. Yeah, I mean, aggressive I'm hockey. not by any means was yeah. like the first guy to get in there. But you do see stuff. I mean, sometimes you see these big hits on TV and nobody does anything. And I'm just like, I, I'll start thinking like it's a bad locker room. Like they have a bad t- Like that's just immediately what I think. And it's just, you're right. It's just kind of crazy how there's no accountability. It's just, it's nuts. Yeah. No, you know, it's funny, and I worked in the radio here for uh, ten years. And some of the guys on the radio, when we'd get a new player, or they talked about Shea Weber, or they talked about this guy coming in, or that guy. They'd say, "Oh, he's really good in the room." And some of these smart asses on the radio would be like, "Oh, I, I want a, a guy that's good on the ice," you know. And they don't have a freaking clue what it takes to build a team and hold the team together through an 82-game season, and then the playoffs, forget about it. So it, it's just funny how the, it's so important when you bring up the team thing. And when you, when you did bring it up, John, it, it spurred my mind. For you, I want to know who was one of your, your favorite coaches. Now, I know goaltenders, the Del- not a goalie coach, but head coach. And, and, and what is it that you look for in a coach when you're picking a coach for – uh, the U.S. Olympic team or the World Juniors? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the two kind of align um, because, I mean, I played in three different places for Roger Nielsen, and I think the world of the guy, so I would pick him because yeah. he go. did the homework, right? He was known as Captain Video, as a head He's coach. Ahead. He's ahead, ahead of his, of his time. time. And yeah. he got his assistants to do the other work, the power play penalty killing. We had, I mean, he set up the whole meeting, you know, sequence the way it exists today. Uh, He has set up uh, coaches clinics that used to educate and still do in his passing decades later. That's how far in front of the game. So I, I really respected him. The other thing I respected him is he didn't have to use foul language to get his point across. He, he just got his point across saying, listen, we're the library. We give you guys the information. It's up to you guys to carry it out. To me, that's the one thing that does pass over. So when we look at coaches today, we're looking at guys who grind. Who's going to do the homework to deliver to the players the information necessary in, our, in order to carry out our plan? Not somebody else's plan, not Canada's plan, not Finland's plan, but our plan. And and if they can't do that or if they don't want to do that and they want it to be their own plan, then they can go coach their own team. And so I say that because I've learned so much from Roger on the details that 
you know, a guy like Dallas Eakins would probably answer the question the same way with the Anaheim Ducks, who, my, in my view, should be up for coach of the year because he's one of the good young coaches in the game that is giving his team life through a GM change, through a whole regime change with players, not having star players and play having to play young guys. I mean, Dallas Eakins is probably one of the best coaches in the leagues, and I think he just takes – that page out of Rogers playbook. Now I'm pumping Dallas's tires and he'll probably come to me and say, Hey, I want to coach the world, ju- world junior team or the Olympics in four years, but it doesn't work that way. Right. It's, it's a game of opportunity that way. And, but we look at that, you know, I mean, in our plan, you know, to take this to the USA hockey level now and, you know, get into a few of those questions if you'd like, but, you know, we need to be known as a fast, hard, nosed hard to play against country um finland's known for that and it's not taking a page out of their playbook it's taking a page and building on our playbook of what we want to play at every one of our levels like we failed it, it in some of those ways this time around but we did the best we could but i think that with our national team development program we're producing players because they're playing a fast elevated game and um uh, you know, we're proud of that in our country, and our country should be proud of that. But I'll, I'll say that coaches, you know, goalies have a special relationship with coaches. And I'll tell a brief story of an article that I read in Sports Illustrated back in 1996. And it may be relevant, it may not, but it was between, at that time, Mike Holmgren and a young up-and-coming quarterback named Brett Favre. And at the time, they had a choice to make. And he and Mike Holmgren at the time had, I mean, Andy Reid and a whole list of other assistant coaches that he went to and asked 10 coaches who should start the first game of the playoffs. And they had another good quarterback at the time. His name was Mark Brunel, a lefty who became pretty famous with the Jacksonville Jaguars, I believe, or, or another team. I don't professional football that well but this story hit me because Mike Cormoran said this I came into the room and announced the starting quarterback was going to be Brett Favre Brett Favre and I are attached at the hip everything we do we have to do together and if we don't do it together he does, he'll he never have a chance to be successful and our team will never have a chance to be champions well a young Brett Favre heard that he took it to heart and said wow this guy really believes in me. And the rest is history. He goes on to be the MVP of the league on a few occasions, and they won the Super Bowl. And that's what it takes in a relationship with a goalie and a head coach. And to me, when I had that in the places that I was, I could be successful. Without it, I doubted the coach, and I doubted the play, and you just doubt. And and that's how important that position is and i'll tell you right now between you look at the last two stanley cups and vasilevsky and john cooper john i told john cooper that story uh at a level five seminar at usa hockey's level five seminar in lake placid about three years ago and every time i see him he's like i love that story and and it's those types of things that you see uh, around the league that if you have that relationship with that coach and that goalie watch out because that's success no oh. super duper <laughs> johnny cooper right super were you at the Johnny's olympics this uh, uh, last olympics were you there in beijing i was supposed to be but i didn't make it um so I, we put the team together we went to la and before we were going in um i got covid so, uh, long story short, I drove 33 so hours home from LA because uh, I wasn't going to stay in the hotel there. And, and then I was, one, once you get it, you, it's hard to test out of it. So I, I didn't, I wasn't able to make it. So as a, you know, and Persona as a fan of, of the game, yeah, yeah, they really as a missed fan, me. As a fan, <laughs> as a fan of the game, I think you, this is two years, uh, Olympics now. I was, I was still playing the last, the last Olympics where they had to use replacement players. And I, uh. I was just, you know, my, th- I thought I was, you know, I played on three world championships. That's when Jimmy Johansson passed away. 
Um, and, um, yeah. you know, I, I think Shelly was a coach too, you know, and I, I, I didn't make the team, but as a fan, it sucks to see not the NHL players, right? So, you know, from your yeah. perspective, is that kind of the not, – not that it sucks, but is it kind of different – and, and I guess excitement, or is it just the same? Like, how is it with these younger players, replacement players? Is it, it's, it's got to be a little bit different, right, approach? Yeah, that's a um, hard question to answer, but I'll answer it this way, is that the team that we put together in a short period of time probably has, on that team, minimum 10 going to be NHL standouts three probably superstars but they just don't you just don't know it yet so we went young and i knew these players real well through world junior and i asked quinny do you want to go young because they're going to give you the best chance to win now we had some veterans you know so but we have 15 college players and if you're asking the nhl players right now to go to the world championships they'd probably say i don't want to go with a bunch mm -hmm. of college kids <laughs> So you got to know the measure and what is what's available to you. So we gave some guys opportunities um, like Jeff or uh, Jake Sanderson. You know, we lost him late. You know, he got COVID, couldn't go, went and played a game. Then he hurt his shoulder. That's a superstar defenseman, top one, one, two, going to play for the Ottawa Senators. And I'm not going out on a limb to say that. So, um He's playing for North Dakota right now, and Pierre Maguire is chasing him around with a contract in his back pocket. And, you know, Owen mm -hmm. Power that played for Canada, Buffalo's chasing him around with a contract in his back pocket. But uh, Matty Beneers. Yeah, Beneers. So I love that the kid, and so He's a good player. All that to kid. say is I think it was yeah. a little bit different this time than 2018 because we had those players available to us. You know, Jimmy passing was very untimely for that. And um, I think he would have made the same decisions, even though, you know, I think at the time, and you can't go back on it, you know, the coach there really has to want to play that type of player too. And you know that, Tim, that, you know, uh, to be given an opportunity, um, you know, is an interesting thing. And I think they... They, they learned their lesson. I mean, we learned from it. So this time around, we were going to go with younger guys, and we did. And we never lost in regulation. We lost in the shootout. We won every game we played. We lost in a shootout. And, you know, this was a, yeah. a team that could challenge for a gold. Uh, but if you talk to Finland today, they know that they won a, a tournament that didn't include the best players. And I think that's your point. Um I do believe in 2026 we're going to see that, and I do believe we're going to see it in in 32 as well that the NHL players will be playing. And I feel strongly that that the NHL is looking at the international game, and that, that we're going to see World Cups every other year in February. And um, you know, I think that they're. Uh, I think that's what I see. I don't know if it's going to happen, but, I mean, I know there's... No, you're right, though, about, like, what people don't know is, is you know, when I was playing yeah. over in, in Europe and Russia and we would end earlier, a lot of those European teams, like, a lot of those guys play together, you know? Like, they don't have, like, enough NHL players where, like, it's going to be all NHL, you know, like, Russian guys. It's going to be all NHL Finland guys. So, like, the U.S. team did really well this year because I know, like, a lot of those other countries, like I said, yeah. they're, pl they're training... And getting ready for that tournament for like six, you know, six, seven weeks, and they're building chemistry. And like at least for world championships, like we would we would meet on the plane. And that would be like you know, and then we'd practice and yeah, you know. So it's, it is it is kind of interesting. That's what we had. We had six. Yeah. We had six yeah. practices. Um, so, and that and those are you know, it's a unique experience. Look at I, I mean I I think that there's things happening. I I mean I know that they're all being talked about, but I'm just saying, I, I see, you know, like this time through was a really tough time. I mean, COVID's messed up everything. And, but I, I do believe that the players want to play, um, which is probably the biggest indicator. Uh, but I mean, we live in a different world right now as we speak, you know, very unfortunate what's going on around the world. And, you know, our heart goes out to the people um, overseas in Ukraine and things like that. I mean, we just, we've, we haven't lived through this, uh, during our lifetime to know how to respond to it. 
Johnny, uh, your position with USA Hockey, awesome. You've done a great job. There's no question about it. Um, really, um, in watching the young developmental um, teams and just USA Hockey go back to the Olympics. You know, meanwhile, the 80 Olympics winning the gold medal is incredible. What a what a, a starting point uh, for USA Hockey to really to bring it, to, you know, into the limelight. And when I look at that, I still should have made that team, by the way, uh, 1980, but I didn't. Uh, they didn't need any tough guys. Um, but uh, let's think for a minute. I wanna I wanna get. I want to put you in charge of the NHL. Okay, you're going to be the commissioner of the National Hockey League. What, what would you change in the game to, I guess, make it make it better than it is? And think about the yeah. red line back when we played the red line in. They took it out. It's a fast game. What would you do uh, to to make it better? Well, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, everybody could be you know, Gary Bettman for a day and say, I would take out the trapezoid and, and, you know, put in illegal defenses and things like that. I mean, I don't think that's, I don't think that that's necessary. I think, you know, to me, I would probably officiate it. I would have it officiated differently. Um, I think the game's so fast now that, you know, um, while they spend time on the ice and they're you know i really like when they huddle together and try to get a call right i just think that the game is so fast it needs to be faster and and the offic the way it's officiated slows it down um like a high sticking with a puck like high sticking rule came in because guys didn't have helmets now everybody's wearing a mask and a helmet yep. like what is that that's a, actually a skilled play to be able to knock the puck down why why should you blow it dead I would look yeah. at the competitive elements of the game and get rid of half the rules. Um, it's like golf. I mean, I mean, I, I'm a golfer. I mean, half the rules nobody knows about, nobody cares about, and you watch them have to diddle around with all these rules. Like, you hit it out of the bounds, drop the ball, move on. Like, I mean, like, why do you slow the game? Like, slowing sports down is is the problem, and you can take it to any other sport. Uh, baseball, like walking out to the mound, like what else do you, what do you have to talk about Yeah, that you need to make a trip to the mound because your guy's psychologically a problem. That's actually what the fans want to see is how he handles the pressure on his own. You know, and it's a famous, there, there's so many famous times where a guy walks out to the mound, the guy throws the next pitch and it's gone. <laughs> yeah. Way to go, buddy. You really helped him out. Yeah. But nobody ever talks about that, but I would, I, I would, increase the pace to where it's a two hour game and you you know that you can sell it to your people that this is going to be a two hour game i mean they reduced it from a three game you how do you do that though how do you do that with the referees how how do you listen they went from one referee system to two which to me created competition you, you allow you them to manage one, the game call that's i think it screws the game you're up. calling things ticky tacky things mm -hmm. that are ticky tacky things that you think are a penalty and they're subjective. Like getting a stick, like knocking a stick out of someone's hand. That's a penalty. So yeah, you're asking me, uh, you're asking me hold the on to your stick. I just think it every time you blow yeah. the whistle, it's a problem. Like it's not basketball. There's no out of bounds. People love to see the play carrying on. You know, it's, it's interesting because you're going to blow it down and you're going to have your three, you know, commercial timeouts anyway. That's when everybody gets a rest. But to me, the game's played so fast that the refs almost slow it down on purpose. They have to interject them. Like, I'm going hot on the officials. I'll probably get in trouble. Of because, <laughs> but but yeah, I, you're I asking me a question. I'm giving you an bastards. answer because I think they're all competitive yeah. elements that we could go from player to player and we can get agreement <clears throat> on every one of these things because most of these rules that are in the game came 40 years ago and they don't apply anymore like we had an instance in junior hockey the other day where the guy got a two-game suspension for running into the goalie he was taking the route where the goalie you know goes behind to stop the puck he comes back this way this guy came around that way the guy took the route to go cut off the puck he ran into him and he stopped nobody did anything there was nothing no in uh. 
No violence came out of it. But he had a little uh, he had a little finger issue. And I, I say that not to be dismissive uh, of goalies or not to be protective, but he took the wrong route. And the guy that you know took the route he took gets two game suspension for that. That's over overdoing. Crazy. And to me, it's a player's game. It's not a referee's game. It's not a coach's game. It's a player's game. And it's got to give, you got to give it back to the players because they can police the game the best. They can play the game the best. And they need to be included in that discussion. And I don't believe, you know, like you pay them a lot of money, you're paying them tens of millions of dollars, and you're not allowing them to be themselves. That's what I would do. I like that. I like that for sure. Uh, when the whole refereeing thing, you know, about, come on, 3,000 minutes later, <laughs> go figure. Um, Johnny, couple couple things. Um, if you uh, if you were to write your hockey eulogy, what would the first line be? I needed the game more than the game needed me. That's a good one. I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. That's good. I'm liking that. <laughs> I'm really good. Yeah, I'll, I'll use it later on the golf course, to be honest. Tim will, too. <laughs> um, and how about if you look back over your life, everything, hockey, you know, just everything you've done in your life, where you are now, uh, biggest regret? Uh Probably the instance I had with a junior player and Trevor Daly back in junior hockey. Um, it's probably my biggest regret because it came out all wrong and uh, it was wrong. Uh, and, you know, I paid a penalty for it, but it never really undoes a, a hurtful thing. And, um, you know, there's, I believe in forgiveness. Um, you know, it, it wasn't meant to hurt anybody. But I, I would think that that's probably my biggest regret in the game. Um, you know, I, I think that God gives us these opportunities to forgive one another. And, you know, um, I know that I had sought, I seek that and um, in that instance. But, you know, we live in a day and a time that, um, you know, we... we it's said that people are more tolerant. I think we're more intolerant than tolerant, but the, I would say mm -hmm. that that's probably one thing that I would, you know, if I could redo it, I'd love to redo it. Um, but, uh, you know, when you're an authority figure, you're a coach, um, and it comes out in a harm, harmful way. It was never between Trevor and myself. Um, you know, players picked up on it. They were using a situation. They wanted to get away with stuff. And you know how players are and how that can happen. But it escalated yeah. to where it didn't need to escalate. And nobody was an adult in the moment. And um, But I'd love to turn that back around and do it another way for sure. Yeah, I'm sure we all in our lives have. Yeah. I know I do. Uh, I'd love to get a do-over. But uh, obviously a lot of times... This world, you don't get that do-over. Um, you, you know, it's going to mention, I coach for a little bit, and um, I look at today's players, and you, know, you work with young kids all the time, but if I'm on that bench and I see a kid go on a, I don't know, three-on-two. Nux hates go, iPads. Oh, oh I you're... would <laughs> fucking grab that thing and throw it in the fucking balcony. I'm telling you, it drives me crazy. Like, uh, honestly, like, okay, you know what you did wrong. You know you made a mistake, whatever. Come back to the bench, catch your fucking breath, and get ready to go the next time. And if we want to talk about it and look at it, because you're a visual learner, son, we'll do it between periods. Put the fucking iPad down. Drive me crazy. How about you? Uh, <laughs> about the iPad or? Do you like iPads? About the three on two. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, no, well, I think that, um, you know, there are things that get in the way of, you know, the way that the game's being processed. Um, I think that 
you know, having handhelds can help in, in a certain moment. Um, but in that moment, do, you know, can your time, 30 seconds, 50, a minute and a half on the bench, truly wrap your head around what you would do next? I don't think there's ever been a coach that, other than drawing up a play on the board that you could possibly execute and everybody was on the same page because you're just one individual. I mean, it takes five individuals to really get six individuals to get on the same page, right? The the goalie out would probably be a time where you'd have enough time to draw up a play or use one from the handheld. But I think the things, you know, and we're going to sound like the over 50 group here, but, you know, they become more right. of a distraction. And um, we talk about it all the time with our young kids at the NTDP where they got to put it in the sleeve and just leave it and not, you know, have your new best friend talking in your ear all the time or you're, you're visually seeing something that you don't need to see. Because if it's given a choice, and the psychologist will tell you this, that seven out of ten times they're going to choose a bad, they're going to make a bad decision um, with their handheld. They're going to they're gonna distract themselves away from what they're supposed to be doing. And, you know, I don't come up with that. That's that's the experts. And, um, you know, like that's a yeah. that's not going to happen on a bench or going over a three on two or anything like that. But there's enough distractions, you know, with people, fans, aggravations on the bench just between teammates. Like everybody thinks, oh, they all get along, you know. Somebody else is going out there ahead of you. Did you ever realize that? Like, and I saw a couple of kids this weekend that we're, we're looking at closely and, you know, give it a head shake when they're not out there for a D zone power play. And they think we're not noticing that. Like, that's a problem for you to make our team. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's those little things that those tendencies that, you know, become instinct that, you know, body language matters, you know? Like it just does. And uh, then the words you say, but the, the big thing for us today, I think with the handheld devices and, you know, if I could just be totally honest with you, I mean, it's just, it's, it's become such a distraction because you never know who's talking through that other end. And uh, they're getting all kinds of advice players are full of so much information that they can't process it fast enough. And I think Nux, that's where we have agreement on it and I don't have to throw it or break it, but I'm, I'm frustrated with it yeah, because I know the amount of disinformation and distraction for young players today is, is hard for them to disseminate. And, you know, people are wondering why, you know, why are so many people distracted and frustrated and not happy? You know, I mean, how about simplifying your life a little bit? Like nobody can accomplish all these things in a day. Like just sit back and enjoy, like smell the air a little bit, go for a walk in the grass, you know, go, go, you know, I mean, th these are all the things that are told to people that are, you know, all of a sudden suddenly get cancer. They're like, man, I just need to go outside and, and look at the trees and take in what God's great earth, you know, like, I mean, those are the things that, those patients say, if you can go and talk to Dale Howard, Chuck, you know, today, bring him back for a minute, you know, I would yeah. spend more time with my family. And, you know, these are the types of things that you don't get back um, in time. And I, I say that, you know, not to be like, we all have these handheld things that we are married to. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if we can set them down, like if I could set mine down for a couple of days in a row and just get away from everything, I mean it's a good it's a good couple of days. Our former teammate yeah. Peter Fleur going through it right now. Not he's not really he's not well. He would be uh, telling you go go uh, see the air, you know, go see the air, uh, uh, Christopher, go yeah. see the air. You know it. <laughs> go, go see go the to air. Paris. Go I don't know if you can see the air, right. but yeah. maybe he meant the hair. Um. <laughs> yeah, the hair called this. Uh, uh, how about Johnny last night? Well, who, looking back, had, I guess, that... I, I have yeah. mentors in my life, certainly, and looking back and who they are. Who was that mentor for you? Who had the biggest impact on John Van Beesbrook and his 
prof- his his life, his career, mm-hmm. and his life up to uh, uh, Believe it or not, the best mentor in my life is my wife. Um, and it's not just, you know, to build up points, to go out and have some fun. It's it's <laughs> not that at all. It's just a good relate. It's a good Welcome relationship that's it. healthy that, you know. I get it. Um, <clears throat> You need that accountability, right? So um, I just think that I need accountability at every corner. And, um, you know, it, it, it helps me every day. So I have it. You know, I have it in her. And, and um, but, I, I, you know, um, I read the Bible a lot. I think that, uh, you know, my relationship has grown in that capacity. So I get mentored by the word. And, and I think that that's a great mentor for everybody because, you know, Christ calls himself the counselor that is to come. And I believe that I've been counseled in, you know, the forgiveness category. And that's an important part to eternity, you know, things bigger than ourselves, sacrifice. But, you know, people wise, you know, I learned from everybody. Nux, you were a great teammate and uh, you'll always be known as a great teammate. Thank you. And I think you that too. we we learn from each other. We learn from, you know, people that we've spent in the trenches with that I look back on and I draw that support. Um, there's guys that didn't want to be in the trenches and you learn from them too. And it's not, it's nothing that should be shunned. But I mean, life's too short to, you know, like the things that I, I don't like is when we become dismissive um, really quickly. <sighs> Um, without giving people a second chance, a third chance. And, you know, we need support like that. But, you know, I'd, I'd have to say my wife's my my great teammate, um, my mentor. And I know that we're on equal ground because we're the same age and all that. But people of your same age can be great mentors and, and accountability partners. So we're fortunate to have that relationship. Wow. Yeah, and that's awesome. Listen, I looked at Jamie, yeah. my partner in life today, uh, my best yeah. friend. Guys were always my best friend. I've never had a woman be my yeah. best friend. She's my best friend today. So I know where you're coming from. That is yeah. uh, awesome, awesome stuff. John, I want to... I like my wife, you. too. I was just wondering. Yeah. better start loving her, then. <laughs> Timmy, I love that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Go on, I'm, Johnny. I'm blessed. I'm blessed with my wife, for, for sure. Good. Oh. Hey, uh, I yeah. want to thank you for joining uh, me today you were a great teammate obviously you know what i think yeah uh the yep. respect i have for you i'm happy uh you're in a good position in life today and uh i'm so yeah. happy you joined us today. it was awesome to catch up and i wish you well um yeah. moving on well, thanks for future. having me on and tim good to get to know you i'll, I'll give you one one yeah, note you too. when i saw your last name stapleton um i didn't tell this story but the people that i grew up skating in their backyard their last names was stapleton and um that okay yeah yeah, yeah. No, i mean i'm from chicago i'm not too yeah. far from you growing up but i had to lie most of my career and said i was related to a lot of the stapletons <laughs> i but know i asked about that too. stapleton my dad my dad right. never played hockey well yeah, good being so. with you guys and um Take it. So. we wish you all the you best. too Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles podcast. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe.